All right, good evening everyone and uh, thank you for joining us for this webinar this evening. Um, I'm Rebecca Stacey, a Senior Land Services Officer based in Daniloquin in the mixed farming space with background experience in livestock systems and animal health. Um, I'll kick it off this evening by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land and waters and paying respect to elders past, present and emerging. Um, so I'm on Burrapa Burrapa land here in Daniloquin. I'd also like to recognise the support of external organisations in bringing this webinar to you all this evening. Um, so we've got Agriculture Victoria and the Southern New South Wales Drought and Innovation Hub funded by the Future Drought Fund have supported us with uh, presentations. So we have a couple of presentations prepared for this evening and a bit of housekeeping to get started. The first presentation is recorded, so you'll need to take questions on notice for Dale Gray regarding the seasonal update and we'll get a response back to you as soon as we can. Questions can be typed into the questions box, which should be showing up for you all. And you can type those in as we go. There'll be an opportunity at the end to respond to questions where we can. If you have specific detailed queries regarding your personal farm situation, just please provide us with some contact details so a staff member can get in contact with you in the next week to discuss in more detail. There will be resources loaded into a handouts tab, which should be showing up in your little control panel. You may find these useful. If you would like to download or save these as we go, please do so. The webinar will be recorded and links for resources will be available on socials, website and emailed to participants later, so you can review back to it. And there will just be a survey at the end, which we would appreciate if you could stay online quickly and complete this for us. It assists us in gauging the success of this evening, as well as planning what topics are required for future sessions. So our first presentation tonight has been provided by Dale Gray. Dale is a seasonal risk agronomist with Agriculture Victoria, with many years experience in climate and seasonal risk outlooks. Dale has provided a spring summer outlook for this evening for the Murray Riverina regions. And then following on from this, we'll have a see, following on from the seasonal outlook, we then have Jeff Minchin, a senior advisor and drought adoption officer with local land services and the drought and innovation hub for Southern New South Wales. Jeff has significant background experience in agronomy, precision agriculture and mixed farming systems, and will be talking to us through planning dry, for dry season conditions the tools and resources available and how to develop these plans and assess your options. So first off, I will start the video for Dale Gray and you can put questions in. We'll take them on notice for Dale and get back to you. Well, hello there to the people of the Riverina. Uh, Dale Gray from Bendigo Agriculture Victoria here with an outlook for spring and summer. Here we have our sea surface temperature anomaly chart and our, uh, our El Nino sitting out here, uh, very warm in on the South American coast and uh, somewhat warm, 1.37 degrees. Um, a threshold of El Nino is 0.8, so it's um, it's really just a weak El Nino in there uh, at the moment. Uh, what is not weak is in the Indian Ocean where we have the most classic pattern of a positive Indian Ocean dipole that you could see. Warm water off Africa, cold, quarter, cold water off Sumatra uh, and really propagating uh, further than I have seen outside that box before. What is not uh, typical from an El Nino perspective is that the water up here to our northeast off the Solomons and Papua New Guinea is completely normal. And by now, uh, we would normally expect that that would have been much cooler than normal up there uh, and uh, evolving a lot less moisture into the atmosphere, but that is yet to happen. The trade winds have been where it's all been uh, expected to happen this year. And in the case of the Pacific Ocean, it hasn't happened. Um, Normally with an El Nino, we'd expect much stronger than normal trade winds to be blowing in a reversed fashion from the uh, west to the east towards the central Pacific. 
um, and we just haven't had their shit that this year. But uh, in the last uh, 10 days, we've seen finally a burst of reverse trade winds in this area, which has just been picked up in this sort of one here. This is a, a one month uh, summary. Um, but it does look like the trade winds are finally picking up, which might mean that the water in this area here will progressively cool um, in the coming month or two. When we look over in the Indian Ocean, uh, well, we see absolute classic positive IOD pattern here, much stronger than normal easterly trade winds, pushing towards Africa, making the colder water up well off the coast of Sumatra. In fact, that is some really strong uh, easterly winds there, which is what's really progressing that cooler water outside uh, the box. The cloud pattern is where it's really at. Uh, and if we look at the Indian Ocean first, because that's the most striking, um, the brown colours, lack of colour, the blues and pinks in abundance, um, there's just a complete lack of cloud coming off that Indian Ocean dipole uh, from Sumatra, you know, two thirds of the way over the Indian Ocean. That is, that is the most massive eye of lack of cloud I've ever seen from a positive IOD. We have uh, some extra cloud coming in over here off the coast, which we would expect uh, in the case of a positive IOD. Uh, so that's absolutely uh, cranking out there at the moment. Uh, we have a, a slight abundance of cloud at the Dateline Junction with the equator, which is uh, in keeping with El Nino, but we've still got an abundance of cloud out here off Papua New Guinea, and that really should be retracted to east of the Solomon Islands. So this is still not really in keeping uh, with uh, an El Nino and is, is probably where a fair bit of the moisture for that rain last week came from uh, up here out of the, uh, the Coral Sea, which is behaving itself uh, fine and dandy. Pressure patterns. Uh, we have a large high pressure that's been Spend, well, on average, has been spending larger amounts of time over the southeastern corner of Australia. It's further north than we would expect for spring, where center, the centre of a high pressure should be over Adelaide. Um, so being further north, that in theory allows fronts through, but it's not allowing the tropics uh, to come down like we'd normally get in spring. Now, there obviously was a hiccup in this uh, last week with the rain, but this prevailing pattern uh, has been going on for a number of months now, and it's been pushing many of the frontal systems further south. And I suspect we'll see more of the same of that uh, in the coming weeks and months. Uh, we've had a large increase in the size of the pressure uh, that's been over, this means those pressure patterns are moving slower, uh, high pressure over the whole of Australia, that's pretty normal for El Nino, uh, lower pressure out here at Tahiti, so the SOI is negative 13.1, higher pressure in the tropics, harder to get moisture down, um, but uh, just the higher pressure over southern Australia means that generally it's, it's the, the, the triggers to rainfall are being hunted away. So just in summary there in terms of the ocean, the El Nino has been mucking around all year um, and its surface and the ocean to depth and the pressure patterns are all uh, absolutely of El Nino, but the wind pressure patterns and the cloud patterns are still sort of mucking around a little bit, but perhaps in the last week or two, it's finally starting to hook in. And the Indian Ocean, well, you couldn't wish for a more positive, positive Indian Ocean dipole in terms of the way that that is behaving and set up. The other climate drive we have is around the Antarctica, around the Southern Annular Mode, um, spends its time in negativity and positivity. Um, once we get into spring, a positive Southern Annular Mode often leads to more rainfall in the Southeast quarter of New South Wales. And if it was over summer, that would poke into the Riverina. We had this really strong spike of positivity, um, which lined up with that rainfall event, and it probably had something to help and do with that. Means there's more easterly flow coming into uh, eastern, uh, southeastern New South Wales as a result of that. Uh, but both uh, the Bureau and the NOAA model predict that this is going to return to normality over coming uh, weeks. Now, generally when we have an El Nino, uh, particularly over summer, we would expect a negative southern annular mode 
which tends to dry off the southeastern uh, quarter or even sort of southeastern Australia there, uh, eastern Victoria, southeastern New South Wales. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see whether that actually manages to hook in or whether the prevailing pattern over the coming last couple of years, and particularly last year with the Tongan volcano uh, forcing a positive southern annual load over, over summer, it's going to be interesting to see whether which of those climate influences actually wins in terms of spinning the SAM either positive, negative, or, or just behaving itself. So I've just updated the climate predictions here with a few models, five of them that have clocked over for October. The rest are still sitting on their September runs. These are predictions for southern New South Wales. Um, the El Nino is predicted to go for the next three months into January. Um, the positive IOD is expected to go on as well, although when you look at most of those models, they do start to break that down in November, which is what we would expect if all things behave themselves. As soon as the northern wet season clicks in, that positive ID should go. But we still have plenty of drier signals uh, for the next three months there, the vast majority of models sitting on the fence. Um, although I do note a few of them, including the bureaus, um, has just gone more neutral for the next three months, um, suggesting that the, yeah, the October, November dry signal is stronger but the December, January is less so, and we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit soon. Um, but we also have very much likelier chances of it being much warmer over the next three months, which both those two climate drivers historically would do. The real crystal ball gazing out into uh, early summer and even ducking a little bit into all of next year, um, all the models keep that El Nino going, uh, and all of them bar one, knock the positive IOD off um, and warm up the ocean up there in the Timor Sea. Uh, and that, you know, would normally cease to not be a climate driver uh, in terms of, a, of the IOD anyway over summer. And now we come back to the, uh, the ballpark here with much more, more neutral forecasts, still a few models going drier over that sort of uh, late summer period. Uh, but a lot of them just sitting on the fence, which is pretty normal for this time of the year. Uh, particularly with El Ninos, um, they don't necessarily and have historically had really variable effects over summer. Uh, but that warm signal still hanging in there quite strong um, with just generally large amounts of warm ocean around the world preheating the air mass as it comes over uh, Australia. Now, just looking here at some historical effects of both El Nino and the positive IOD deniliquin and more broadly over southeastern Australia, and just really showing that the chances of low average and high rainfall are really almost all over the shop, uh, both historically, once we get to November and December. Um, so historically, uh, anything has kind of happened with these two climate drivers, particularly once you get out of the influence of October. Another way of looking things is looking at uh, El Nino's over the summer period and in fact when the Southern Oscillation Index has been strongly negative. This is just for Victoria, um, but I know it does, it continues on into New South Wales as well. Um, it's just uh, an absolute hodgepodge of rainfall that's been above and or below the median for summer and in real close proximity to each other. So it really indicates to me quite stormy conditions here historically, um, and that anything has historically happened uh, over summer. So there in a nutshell, um, that El Nino is finally getting its act together, uh, which has taken a long time, uh, really only the last uh, two to three weeks where that's really linked in more properly. The positive IOD, well, that's been predicted for a long time as well, but it's really uh, only just came about in the last uh, month. Uh, and is the real deal, absolutely. The rest of spring is likely to be drier and warmer as we'd expect from those two climate drivers. Summer is definitely likely to be warmer and possibly drier, but there's no guarantee of a necessarily drier summer as a result of the El Nino. Much more of that uh, uh, influence historically goes up uh, into uh, Northern Queensland with El Ninos over summer. 
Well, that's it from me. I hope you're having um, a good day there up there in the uh, in the Southern River Arena. Um, and sincerely, I hope uh, harvest goes well, the crops are great, uh, and the summer season's good too. All the best. Catch you later. All right, thanks for that, Dale. Uh, I'll now hand over to Jeff to talk us through the tools and resources and planning aspect. And as we said earlier, uh, just put your questions in the question box and we'll answer them towards the end. Jeff, over to you. Very good, thanks, Pat. Um, just get this presentation up for you. Just take a, a little second here to get that loaded in. There we go. Um, you can see that back. Yep, good. Ken. Okay. Yep. Well, welcome everyone. And um, yeah, Dale always does a great weather update. I've been following Dale for quite some time. Um, always puts a good spin on um, fairly complex weather modelling, um, puts it into layman's terms and always appreciate his, um, his interpretation. Uh, yep. So um, tonight I'm just going to try to cover off um, a few little things about where we sit at the moment in the Murray and the, and the Riverina region. Um, and for a lot of us who probably think we're in the box seat really compared to other parts of the state. Uh, just get that to click over. Sorry. Yeah. So um, yeah, this is what the um, the current situation in the state looks like under the, using the seasonal update. In, um, developed by the New South Wales DPI. Um, this was from uh, the end of September and it shows how um, it's really the drought or dry conditions are really on the south coast, um, heading up the coast right to the north coast and heading out into the northwest central tablelands and Hunter. Um, for our region, really, Riverina Murray, uh, we're not really, we're not in drought and to be honest, it's really been um, a season that you'd expect in a normal season or an average season um, and drying off in the springtime. Um, if you had checked this map back probably June, July time, um, the drought pit, drought really started up on the north coast in, in the, all the dry season in there um, and around Scone in the Hunter Valley and Bega also showed up quite early. So since then the dry conditions have sort of drifted uh, from east to west, um, and um, from the from the north coast, they've travelled quite a way into the northwest. Um, also, southern Queensland is is also fairly dry. Um, so, as I was saying, um, the, the conditions in the River and Murray are pretty much what we expect in an average or a normal season. Um, September was particularly dry, which in across the River Riverina area particularly, so it did let the team down. Um, prior to that, um, the season was tracking along really well. Um, we have seen a few uh, crop impacts during September where, um, due to dryness, where crops uh, had drawn down their subsoil moisture and were starting to run out prior to that last rainfall event last week. Um, and we also had some frost impacts in the northern and, and part of the central Riverina area. Um, haven't heard too many reports from the Murray of any frost impacts down that way. And given the wet conditions that you were under, I'd say that would be minimal anyway. So all in all at the moment, we'd be looking to be uh, pretty happy compared to others in the state. Um, on this one, it's a 150 day drying trend across the state. And we can see that, that again, that drying is more close to the coast, the Hunter, North Coast, South Coast region, um, and the Southern Highlands, and slowly drifting uh, from East to West, um, making its way 
into that sort of northern and central riverina area in, that, in the last little period. Um, those maps will be updated end of the month of October. So it'll be really interesting to see how much, how further the red zones developed and, and moved further west. Um, so being that uh, the bombs forecasting El Nino conditions from now into early 2024 um, and, a, and a fairly dry and warmish summer. Um, and now for us is really the time to start planning and um, for that that predicted weather conditions and put in put in some planning to set us up uh, for autumn next year, which is probably going to be the crunch point for our two regions in the Murray and Riverina. Um, that if we were to stay dry and warm through till that period, and then um, we didn't see a normal autumn, um, things would probably start to um, fall apart in terms of our farming systems. So, um, as I said, now's the time to start planning. So some of the tools we've got at hand, um, which are really available on the internet or um, through your local land services, um, local advisors. Um, this one here is a, the drought plan template, which is um, available on the Drought Hub website. Um, a great little tool and something that we, I believe all farms should have sitting in the back cupboard somewhere that you um, can pull out when, it, when there's a prediction of a dry period that we pull it out and have a look at um, how we will deal with the current dry situation that may be developing. Um, so basically we run through what fodder we have on hand, what its quality, um, particularly given fodder on hand at the moment that was made particularly the last three years that may still be on hand. Some of that, some of that hay was made under fairly wet conditions probably had more rain on it at hay making time. And um, something that I would be checking is how, what the quality's like in that, in that hay. Um, so heading along and grabbing a feed test of those, um, that fodder on hand would be really beneficial. Um, in the present time, there's an opportunity that if you had hay that wasn't up to your standard or what you would like to use, um, there's an opportunity to put that into the market and maybe even make new season hay, um, given the excellent hay making conditions at the moment. Um, we could produce very good high quality hay this year and um, put yourself in a, in a better position. Then we walk through a pasture budget. So what grass have we got on the ground at the moment? How long will that last, given the current um, stocking? and um, whether you will need a supplement or a decision around um, offering supplement in terms of grain to livestock so that the current pastures that you have on hand can be stretched out and get the maximum benefit from them and, and the high utilisation. Um, and one of the other things to think about it again is around quality. So given the Murray region had some significant rainfall events uh, last week, um, any dry sanding feed or even pasture paddocks that were perhaps spray fallowed would um, would actually be poor in quality, will we'll be dropping in quality since that rain, that rain event. Um, so um, I've actually um, lost the slide. No, I haven't, sorry. Um, so yeah, fodder, pasture, the, the other one that we need to consider is your water availability. And given the situation in the two regions at the moment, the water availability would be excellent, I would think, across most properties. Um, probably not going to be a major issue in the short term. Um, heading into you know um, early to middle of next year, if we were to run into further dry periods, um, then, then that would be a real consideration. Um, one thing you need to look at is setting trigger points. So at, at what points, at what stages over the next three, four, five, six months that you need to set um, trigger points that will force a decision. So that might be something around water supply, could be around um, feed, feed requirements on farm, outstripping what you've got at hand. 
uh, feed costs. So given the grain and hay pricing is, is um, probably above the average at the moment and probably rising, um, we need to be able to set out what, what total value of feed you're prepared to put out. And once you get to that point or close to it, what's the decisions you're gonna make at that time. Um, funds availability is also a big consideration. Um, how's your cash flow? Um, how's your um, financial position rolling at the moment? And is there, is there major decisions you need to make if, that, if there's a bit of pressure in that regard? Um, and the other one would, is around reaching, um, reaching a data with no rain or with um, very little rain or drying, further drying conditions. Um, uh, what, what decisions you should be making at that time. So then you set out a bit of an action plan of what the action is, what's the plan date, um, when you might review it and whether you've achieved that or not. Um, other part of that, this, this drought planning template is looking at what stock you've got at hand, what class of stock, um, what's the value, whether you plan to sell them where, or whether you plan to retain them, uh, what's your plan sale date, if that's your plan, um, and then what's it gonna cost to feed them? And you might work out um, that might be a feed cost per month, it might be a feed cost per week, or it could be a feed cost for the period that you plan to keep those animals for. Um, and again, similarly with the sheep, um, you might you run through a bit of a stock take of what you've got on hand, when they plan to be sold and what feed requirements they may require at, at a particular time. Um, so once you've um, sort of pulled that together and given that such a good situation to be in at the moment in the southern region, um, you might find a trigger point early into next year that you would need to consider um, supplementary feed or offloading or um, taking some action um, at that time. Some other things we, we really learned about last in the last drought period was um, the benefits of early weaning and how we can use that as a, as a tool to allocate feed better, um, particularly for um, young growing stock. We can give our highest quality feed to those animals. Um, we, um, I mentioned there before about supplementary feeding. So whether we're offering grain um, to livestock while they're on pasture, to, to push that pasture out a little bit in how long it um, lasts for. And the, um, the drought and supplementary feed calculator app is a great little tool to, um, to work through those sort of calculations. Um, something I can't really cover off tonight, but uh, we can definitely um, look at um, doing some training or um, showing people how to go through those calculations on there. Um, and, then, and then finally is maybe a sales and culling strategy. So once it comes to time that you've got to start offloading stock or making some harder decisions, that what's, what's your strategy around culling and um, reducing numbers if, if that's a plan for you? Um, so we just we did cover off a little bit on water, but um, again, will the resources that, that are on farm last a distance? And what is the backup plan if they don't? So number one, when we're managing drought, is if you, if you haven't got a good water supply, then it's really um, really challenging to go on and feed livestock if if there's not enough water around. So um, and planting water is um, a real challenge, not something that I would recommend. Um, then around your financial resources, talk to your banker um, and, your, and rural financial councils are very, really useful. Um, one of the big learnings from previous droughts is talk early and talk often, particularly to your major financer or your bank. Um, they really can be really helpful in terms of um, understanding your position. Uh, they'll understand better where your, where your business is going if, if you have an open conversation with them and, and even the hard conversations are ones that they want to hear. So it's really important to, to talk early and talk often. Uh, the other, some other options around, which have been around a while now, so the Regional Investment Corporation, 
um, and the Rural Assistance Authority loan schemes um, are really great for debt restructuring or on-farm investment um, to help with drought preparedness. Um, and through the Drought Hub website, there's um, links to how to look at that, the information around those, those loan schemes and how to access them. Um, so once, once you've got your plan in place, um, step number three is really make sure you implement it. So it's no use having a plan sitting on the shelf that uh, just sits there and you actually don't put it into play. So um, really important that once you've made those decisions and put them in place, you've shared them with your, your farm staff or your team or your partner, if you're in a partnership on farm, and make sure that everyone is on the same page and understands uh, where, the, where the decisions have been made and when. And I'd really recommend um, doing some regular reviews, particularly maybe um, between now and Christmas time. If you, if you were to do a plan now, I'd probably look at a review around Christmas time once we get a bit be better feel for the forecast into next year. Um, and then from then on, be looking at say a monthly or bi-monthly um, review process. So it, um, the main question is, if it stays dry for the next six weeks, what decisions would need to be made? Um, then if it was to stay dry for a further three months, what decisions would need to be made on from there? Um, and then the big one around if it was to stay dry for a further six months from the, from now, what what further decisions have to be made? Just so you're thinking forward about um, those bigger decisions and planning forward. Um, and as always, um, one of the big ones, and it's really important at this point in time given we've had um, significant stress across the regions in terms of previous drought, flooding, fire, and other natural disasters, is to remember to look after yourself and look after you, your family, your staff, and your neighbours, and just keep an eye out for um, people who may not necessarily be um, travelling so well um, and, and see what you might be able to do to, to get, lend them a hand. Um, so once you've, you've got your plan in place um, and you've got your, you, you've lined up to do your regular reviews, um, you may have, have in your plan that you want a certain number of stock that you want to carry forward um, in a sort of a no matter what situation. So they might be um, long-term breeding stock that you're not prepared to um, offload at any stage. Um, our major number one recommendation in that situation, particularly when it gets to full hand feeding, would be to put them into confinement and um, feed them in a, in a stock confinement area. Um, it's probably not a practice for everyone, but it is definitely um, well worth the effort um, with um, high quality breeding stock. Uh, it's it's a number one for protecting pastures, protecting ground cover and um, making their job of feeding the livestock a, a lot more efficient. So if you're going to head down that track, there's a great guide called the, the Guide to Confinement Feeding. Um, it's available online and we also have hard copies through our, um, through our local land services offices. Um, if you're going to head down that track, and there have been a lot of people around across the regions during the last drought and, and even through the flood period, um, setting up for confinement is you really need to do your numbers around what you're going to feed, what's going to cost you, um, and how long are you prepared to feed them, and are you prepared to do that? Um, uh, the other thing is what stock do we want to carry forward is probably your first decision, decision as well, and are we really set up for it? So if you're not set up for confinement feeding at the moment, um, then it's a, it's a matter of setting up some pens, getting a simple design laid out uh, in a good position um, and get maybe getting some advice from one of our staff to, to help help you through that process. Um, some other resources on the New South Wales Drought Hub include the Managing Drought Guide, um, which is this little booklet in the, in the picture there. It's, um, it's got lots of little tips and tricks around feeding stock, nutrition, animal health, um, lots, of got, lots of tips from previous droughts. Uh, it's recently been upgraded, so it's, um, 
an excellent publication. Um, also on the Drought Hub, there's some business and finance assistance information around the Farm Business Resilience Program, the Farm Innovation Fund, um, Regional Investment Corporation that I mentioned before. So um, really recommend if you if you are needing some assistance and support, um, contact one of the drought support officers, drought adoption officers like myself um, through LLS, maybe a rural financial counselling service or work with your farm advisor to get that plan in place and um, get you on track for dealing with what might come over the next four to six months. Some of the um, the other tools on this uh, on the Drought Hub website include the, the state seasonal updates. So the, the previous maps that I showed earlier on um, come from the seasonal update. And there's a whole range of little tools and uh, commentary around um, the seasonal conditions across the state and drilling right down to your your particular region. So um, if you want to delve, delve deeper into those seasonal conditions, you can always jump in there and have a look at um, those those um, reports from the New South Wales DPI. So really, in summary, for me, um, I think that the, the Murray River and the regions are really in a good position, um, which probably at, the, at this point in time reflects a normal average season. We're really well positioned to make plans now for the next six months to avoid any sort of disaster or difficult management conditions in, um, from dry and those predicted dry conditions into next year. So the best thing really we can do is, is to plan, plan and plan and make some early informed decisions to be on the front, front foot um, uh, before we get into say early next year. So um, Beck, that's probably uh, my main message for the tonight and happy to answer any questions that people may have. Thanks, Jeff. I think very informative um, and yeah, lots of good information. The links for links for any documents are in the uh, questions box there. And that's as we said at the start, it'll it's recorded, so there'll be a recording available. Uh, in the next couple of days and an email sent around with the recording and links to these resources as well. So have we got any questions coming through in the question box? Naomi, we need to defer to you for that one. No questions have come in so far. Okay, lovely. In the meantime, if anyone if anyone does have any questions, certainly add them into the chat box. Otherwise, uh, I'll get Naomi to put the link for the survey in the questions box. Um, and if you could all go to the link and complete the survey, that would be much appreciated. We might also include it in the email that goes around in case anyone missed it. But if you can answer it now, that would be great. It's all useful feedback and it'll help us get more of these going with topical information for you. Have you got a drought plan implemented on your farm, Jeff? Uh, yeah, I do actually. Well, I've got a, a strategy that I've put in put in paper on um, in the last drought period, and um, yep. we we tend to manage our numbers and make some early decisions around um, offloading some older stock. We do we undertake early weaning, which obviously just only a couple of weeks ago um, early weaned, what I would call early weaning, and um, we also undertook that in the last drought, so um, it helps to um, prioritise feed for those animals that need that higher quality feed that might be on farm. Yep. And so you'd be referring um, back to 
that at the moment to have a look at where you're up to if it gets dry come autumn time? Yes, sure. Um, we we um, always have a plan of putting in um, grazing crops or dual purpose crops. So um, at the earliest opportunity, that's part of our plan that coming into autumn next year or late summer, um, we'll take that opportunity if it comes. Um, in that opportunity, it'll be um, a matter of then deciding around offloading or feeding and um, utilising some country, some hill country that's rested long term um, as, a, as a drought reserve. Yep. Sorry and what some of the... A... Sorry, Sorry to interrupt, Beck. We just had a question come through. The question is, the upshot at the moment is we are not in drought, is that correct? What is the prospect for autumn? Yep, so the upshot is at the moment we're not in drought, particularly in Riverina Murray. Um, prospect for autumn is it's very difficult for the bomb to give you a prediction between from now to autumn. It's um, the, the predictions or the, the indicators for what autumn might look like won't really show in the models until probably January, February. Um, the, the accuracy around um, forecasts this far out and over this period of time over summer, really the accuracy doesn't increase into probably February next year. So um, we, it's a crystal ball really for, to see what autumn might be like next year at this point in time. Thanks, Jeff. The only other thing I was going to ask was, how did you initially go about, I guess, assessing your water, your on-farm water resources, and making sure that that plan was appropriate? Yeah. So, um, look, for our property, um, we've invested somewhat in farm dams over time. The uh, the Millennium Drought actually exposed some some of our property that. Um, actually ran out of water to end up with a situation where um, you have water but no feed and feed where you don't where you, no feed where you don't where you have water um, which is difficult to manage um, so we've been through a process of after that millennium drought as we um, invested in cleaning dams out upsizing some rebuilding and renovating some um, and that was um, it was, that was the process we went through. We got caught out with um, not enough water. Since that time, we, um, we've had ample, well, plenty of water for the, the number of stock that we're running and uh, we've been able to manage quite well. So we, we invested when we needed it. Excellent. Top take home tip. From tonight, or take top tip from today, or at the moment is, um, is I think be careful of listening to a lot of the media hype around um, disastrous drought conditions. We're not really there at that point in time. We're pretty average, our average season. Things look good. There's lots of great crops through the Riverina and Murray, and we're sitting in a really good position. Um, top tip would be don't get complacent about um, th that position and make some really good plans and decisions early heading into next year. Excellent. Thanks, Jeff. Now, I have just been reminded as well um, with all this talk about planning and assessing your resources and needs. So there is upcoming a farm water planning project, uh, which LLS is leading, funded through the Future Drought Fund um, in conjunction with several external organisations and the Southern New South Wales Drought Hub. Uh, and there will be on-farm workshops and field days, demonstration sites. Uh, so keep an eye out through you know, your local 
Landcare groups, there's a couple of regional organisations included in it, um, Holbrook Landcare Network, Rice Growers Australia, West Murray Land Improvement Group, West Hume and Corowa District Landcare. Uh, so just keep an eye out through you know, your external groups or through the local land services Murray pages as well, um, where you get your information from. Keep an eye out for projects like those. There has also been a Saving Our Soils project funded through Future Drought Fund, uh, which includes uh, right. demonstration and field day sessions or workshops around stock containment areas and feeding. So if you have a chance and want to get in touch with any of those, um, either ask your local office or yeah, keep an eye out through your external organisations as well, whether they are hosting them. So not everyone is hosting them, but there's a few that are involved in that as well, with still a couple of sites to go, I think, if you're interested in those. Naomi's got another question for us. Yeah, I've got another couple of questions. The first one is, what can you do if your dam is a bit leaky? Uh, yeah, so um, a couple of options. One is um, there is a polymer product uh, that can be used to um, put into a dam and um, can in some cases help stop or reduce the amount of leakage. Um, and my experience, I've seen it be successful and I have seen it be not so successful. So it is a bit tricky to say, give you a full guarantee that it's going to work. Um, the other option is, that um, earth moving contractors um, can go about when the dam is dry, actually putting a liner in. If they can locate whereabouts that um, that leakage is, they can um, either dig it out and try and reseal it, or they can actually put a, a plastic sheet inside the dam where they believe that leak is and um, be able to stop it th through putting a liner in it. Um, Lining dams used to be very expensive, but it's actually um, fairly cost effective these days. Um, and that, unfortunately, or fortunately, the best opportunity to do that is when it's in, when you're in drought and there's no water in the dam, obviously. Thanks, Jeff. The second question is, how do you decide if you should keep your breeding stock or sell them and buy when it rains? Yeah, that's a, that's a really subjective question. So um, I would really want to be crunching the numbers about what's the productivity of those animals. Are they meeting your goals for your production? Are there better animals or better genetics out there or a, a better line of stock that um, would perform better in your situation? And to make that assessment, you probably need to talk to some um, maybe livestock advisor or consultant around really crunching your numbers on the performance of your livestock compared to maybe other livestock enterprises in your region, maybe through a benchmarking group or similar. And then um, looking and getting on the search for a, a line of stock that are going to meet your um, meet your goals if, if you come to that decision around offloading now and um, buying back in uh, when conditions are better. Um, I do know quite a few people who have chosen to um, take the opportunity in during droughts to offload their current stock stocking and, and search for um, better performing livestock and have um, been able to do it fairly um, economically as, as the prices are depressed. It's, off, it's often a good time that if you want to make those hard decisions, uh, it can be um, made well during those periods. All right, thanks Jeff and thanks everyone who's joined us this evening. Thanks for your time, thanks for your questions. Hopefully you got something out of it um, and like we said, yeah, resources are available, links in the questions box and there's a couple of handouts there if you want to download them. If you 
want any further information, feel free to contact your local land services office and speak with a team member. Um, so there's ag team members scattered around. There's a few drought adoption offices uh, in Jeff's area or get in touch with Jeff himself and, and he can discuss yeah, some options with you and who's around. And otherwise, you, yeah, if there's no more questions, I guess we'll wrap it up for the evening and let everyone get on with their other jobs. And you can be in touch if we need to. Very good. Thanks, Beth. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Naomi.